All right. Good afternoon, Realtors. Uh, thank you all for joining in this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Kromitis. I'm the CEO of the South Carolina Association of Realtors. And today we have a very special guest to talk about a very important topic that's front and center for uh, not only our members, but uh, our staff that, that serve our members. And, um, and just, I think, the, the population at, at large. I think this is going to be a great discussion and hopefully a, uh, a conversation starter for your local uh, association meetings, your uh, company sales meetings, and anytime our members get together. So we've got folks piling into the uh, attendee room, Dr. Janet. So I am going to uh, go ahead with the introduction. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Janet Taylor. Uh, who's going to join us today. She is a community psychiatrist and executive coach in Sarasota, Florida. She is on the front line battling the emotional and economic impact of mental illness. She holds an MD from the University of Louisville, completed her psychiatry residency at New York Medical College, and obtained an MPH from Columbia University's School of Public Health in Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. She completed her coaches training at the Coaches Training Institute. She has a column in the Family Circle magazine, and you may have even seen her uh, on uh, ABC's Good Morning America uh, or even the Today Show on NBC. She's a former host of the Discovery Health series called Facing Trauma and was the guest care director for the Jeremy Kyle Show. She's an expert in the neuroscience of implicit bias conscious allyship and leadership. Dr. Janet is the author of the Amazon bestseller, The Courageous Classroom, creating a culture of safety for students to learn and thrive. We're so pleased. Please help me give a warm South Carolina welcome to Dr. Janet Taylor. Welcome, Dr. Janet. Oh, thank you so much, Nick, and hello to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to join the call today. Um, as you know, I'm going to talk about self-care, putting the self in self-care and unlocking um, stress management. So I would invite you, I know it's a big call, but just to check in with yourselves right now and to write in how you are feeling into the chat and just use one word. Just take a, close your eyes or keep them open and one word to describe how you are feeling today. And we'll kind of monitor that. So thank you. So some of the objectives today are to talk about what it is to um, have self-care and the neuroscience of it, to discuss the reality of, about being a realtor and certainly working in that industry as it relates to stress, anxiety, and burnout and what the barriers are to optimal functioning, to learn how to optimize stress, understanding that stress, um, unfortunately, is a, is a normal part of, of life. And I say, unfortunately, what I really mean is if you're fully engaged in your life, there is stress. For some people, it's overwhelming, but how we can use it, how to vibe to mitigate stress, and then importantly, to certainly have a, um, a mindful self-care act. And unfortunately, I can't see the chat, but um, I, I can I can read some of those. Can for you read you. some? Thank you. That would be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we've got uh, tired, overwhelmed, great, uh, busy, excited, grateful, uh, overwhelmed is repeated a couple of times, okay. uh, anxious, grateful, stressed, um, juggling lots of balls, uh, frustrated, anxious, uh, good afternoon, um, tired, worried. Mm. Yep. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for sharing. Thanks for reading that, Nick. And the important thing for each of, of you to understand is at every moment, you need to check in with how you are feeling, what the sensations are in your body, what you are thinking, because the real key about self-care and stress management is we can use our brain to flip the script, so to speak, to change our mindset. And, and I will show you how to do that, but that really is the work. So there's no question that, you know, today's society and um, it's heavy, right? There's a lot going on, but we need to pay attention to how we're feeling so we can stay, take steps to change it. 
And as you were listening to me today, I just want you to think about the importance of our thoughts and the power of our thoughts. So often when we hear things that may challenge us or be in difficult situations, we will go below the line. And by below the line, that means that, you know, we'll, we'll blame others instead of taking accountability. We make excuses and denial because of something that happened that may make us feel a certain way. And what we really want to do is when we face challenging situations, understand that that line is a choice and we can get creative. We can get curious. We can take ownership for how we are feeling and what we're thinking with a real key being, how can we use that communication? How can we use that interaction to make us better? So think about that as you are listening in case you hear something that may challenge you or going through something that we always have that opportunity to go above the line. And, and that relates to our self-care because our brain is our biggest ally during this time. And having positive, positive thoughts can in fact change our brain. And I will remind you that no matter how heavy it feels right now, Paula Freire, who was an educator from Brazil says, it's imperative that we maintain hope even when the harshness of reality may suggest the opposite. And it's not to sugarcoat whatever you're going through right now, but just knowing that on the other end of feeling stressed, um, can be relief, you know, can be happiness, and often they can coexist. But what it really means is paying attention to what we need to. So with that in mind, I would invite you, if you're standing in a car, sitting wherever you are, to just breathe, to if you can put your feet on the floor or just be grounded in whatever space you're in, to take a big inhalation in, Hold it for four seconds and exhale out. Do it again, in, hold, exhale out for four seconds. And when we, like if you're feeling overwhelmed as some of you said, or feeling stressed, or if you're feeling great, you know, do more of that. But when we take a deep breath in, when our lungs fill with air, it ever so gently pushes on our vagal nerve, which innervates our heart. And so it slows it down a bit. And so when you are feeling stressed, just being able to relax and go to the breath is a wonderful stress relief technique. And there's a four by four where you take four deep inhalations for four seconds, exhale out for four seconds. You repeat it four times, it's 32 seconds and it can change how you function and how you feel. And the key is not just to do it when you feel stressed, but just when you notice and get in practice of just breathing, because during these times where we have, you know, the twin pandemics, you know, certainly COVID is over, hopefully over, there are different variants, you know, social justice, criminal justice, all these other factors, the election, just the reality of our lives with your caregivers or sandwich generation, taking care of your kids, your family, um, family members, it, it's, it's, it's inflation. I mean, there's a lot going on. But the power that we have is certainly our breath and the power that we have is our brain and the ability to reflect on our strengths, to know that we have made it through and what we can keep doing. So focus on the breath is, is the best um, takeaway. If there's something that you need to say, certainly type it in the chat. You want to try to stay above the line and recognize that we create our own reality. So your words become your beliefs and your beliefs become your actions. So what does that mean? We need to pay attention to how we frame things about us. Is it an I can't or I never um, in, instead of I can, I will. You know, being able to say things like that can help us as we are really unlocking what we need to say and do for our own benefit, for our own self-care, which means we have to own our power. No matter what has happened to you, we still have power. You know, so often things that may have happened in childhood or even happened that today, you know, can add these layers that we have to peel off because we have everything that we need as it relates to stress management, as it relates to unlocking our, our power, but we have to, we have to do the work. It, it doesn't just appear. It is about us putting our potential and, and our passion 
with the reality of our situation and then doing whatever steps it takes to acknowledge it. And so one key factor that you need to know or two actually is our brain wants us to win. Our brain is not against us. Our brain is our biggest ally during these times, and I'll, and I'll show you why. And behind every behavior is a positive intention. When things don't go the way we want them to, it's not a moral failure on our part. It's not necessarily our fault. We want what's best. So the key is to examine those behaviors, pay attention so that we can learn from them. And then also, we are not broken. You're not broken, powerless, or helpless. We are just becoming. And so to be our best selves means that we have to pay attention to our mental health and mental wellness. And that's because our brain is our biggest ally during this time. Our brain is 3% of our body weight and utilizes 25% of our blood glucose and oxygen. So when you're working out, when you are eating food, when you're getting good sleep, we are doing things that help our brain maximize its potential. And the reason that's so important is when, if there's a situation that you have to face, if you're trying to manage something, it's our brain that can help us make the best decisions. And so anything that gets in the way of that, we need to figure it out. And so mental health is, a, you know, when we think about mental health, often we think about mental illness, people may be depressed, adjustment disorder, you know, bipolar, schizophrenic addictions, right? Those are things that can stop us from functioning the best that we can. And the World Health Organization says that there's no physical health without mental health. So when you hear mental health, think mental health in terms of if someone has mental illness, certainly there's treatment, we have to beat the stigma, but think about mental wellness and that should be the focus. And you can have mental wellness even if you have a mental illness, even if you're going through something stressful by paying attention to it, by treating it if necessary, and, and following those steps that help you get what you want. So the World Health Organization says that mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stress of life. And I'm going to say that again, can cope with the normal stress of life. Life is stressful. The choices that we've made, the responsibilities and commitments that we've made can be stressful, but we can also work through them can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to the community. So when we're thinking about how we're doing, we need to focus on, you know, sometimes things at work may not be going well. Sometimes things with relationships might not be going well, but we're doing things for other people in the community or, you know, finding those factors that kind of fill in the totality of what it means to be well and not just focus on one necessarily and optimally you be tens at everything, but sometimes that's not like that. So creating the time to reflect and be self-aware on when things are going well, when they're not, and then determine to correct them is important. There's no question that, you know, in the workforce, and one of the reasons that Nick, you know, wanted me to talk about uh, mindful self-care um, and management is that we're stressed. You know, the COVID-19 with chronic isolation and loneliness, has, has contributed, inflation's contributed. We know that moms with kids under, between the ages, kids, moms of kids with under 18 certainly have increased stressors, but so do individuals between 18 and 24. 75% of them report that their stress levels are high. So worries about inflation, layoffs, burnout, pay a, a toll and, and causes what's called a presenteeism, which is where people are present, but absent because they're so stressed. And that leads to lost predict productivity to the, uh, to the tune of a trillion dollars. There are special ch ch um, challenges for individuals who are realtors or working in that industry. Number one is certainly work-life balance um, with the pandemic and hybrid remote work, missing that uh, social connectivity and, and belonging with colleagues. We know that chronic loneliness and isolation is as big a risk factor for chronic medical problems as smoking and drinking. And that's largely because of the anxiety and stress that happens when people are lonely or isolated. Long work hours with clients that could be tense, you know, not appreciative, going back and forth, or you could have long work hours with colleagues that you don't necessarily get along with, but all of those can impact mental health, workplace health and safety. A lot of people are worried about COVID-19 or what's going to happen if you, you know, go back into the office. 
stress over sales and, and, and external events like um, you know inflation or inventory, um, interest rates, all those other things. And you know elections are coming up and there's a lot of there's a lot going on in the world. And then again, balancing um, that home and, and life demand. So many of you on the call certainly have issues that can cause stress specifically to your industry. You know, there are industry stressors in terms of the real estate cycle, market regulations, infrastructure changes, industry reputation, you know, whether that's locally or, you know, from a state-wide perspective or even nationally, and those transaction stressors in terms of managing products and clients complaining, um, showing properties, negotiating and closing, because unfortunately, you know, most people, uh, don't tell you that when you're doing a good job, they're more likely to tap you on the shoulder and said, uh, you know, like Janet, like you didn't do that so well. And so, you know, it really speaks to how we can, again, really manage our own thoughts and own well being, understanding that 70% of our conscious thoughts are negative, 70%. So when something says, somebody says something or something happens that you think didn't go so well, we have a tendency to hold on to it, to ruminate instead of really looking at how we learn from it and what that means. Our emotions, if we allow them, our emotions change every 90 seconds. But so often, again, because of that 70%. Of negative thoughts that we hold on to, we hold on to things that are negative with maybe this assumption that if we hold on to something bad that happened to us or hold on to something that didn't go so well that we can change it in the future. The reality is the past is the past. You can't change it. So it is about just literally being mindful. And mindfulness is not just letting go, but mindfulness is recognizing what an experience what a word, what a thought is doing to you, and then making a conscious decision to flip it, to see the glass is half full, to reframe it, to challenge it, so that what we can do is hold on to those positive thoughts. Because we know that different experiences, different demands, just different realities can make us feel stressed. And it's important to determine what the word stress means to you, how it impacts you, in your body, because stress is just a word. And just as a, just for some background, um, stress is a term as it relates to the body that was came about in, in the 1930s. And uh, a researcher was recognizing that he was doing research on injecting rats with a hormone. And what he noticed was that Hans Selye was his name. What he noticed is that all the rats that he injected with this hormone had this lump on their neck. But when he looked at all the rats, even once he did not inject, he realized they all had the lump on his neck. And what he found was that they were stressed because he was chasing them around to pick them up so he could examine them. And so he's the one that came up with stress as it relates to people. Stress is a mechanical term. We are not robots. We are not computers. We are meant to, certainly we can handle stress, but we need recovery. We need time off, much like when you have to turn your cell phone off or turn your computer off or any electronics to give them a break. We need that break too. So understand, understand that stress is a word that came out of engineering terms that he used to apply to us. And we're not meant to be stressed 24 seven. But what happens when we are stressed is that our brain sends epinephrine and cortisol to every organ in our body to either turn off or turn on. As, as you are listening to me speak right now, your brain is taking in 11 million bits of information per second, 11 million, only consciously able to process 40 or 50. And those 40 or 50 are meant to keep us safe or let us understand when we need to flee. So that when we see somebody who's other, somebody who may be a different ethnic background, different hair texture, hoodie, not hoodie, you know, skin color, speaking a different language, our brain will scream like other, other. And so that lizard part of our brain and the back of our cerebral cortex, where the amygdala comes in, turns on. And so if we allow ourselves, we will stay in that uh, fear, flight, or freeze mode, which is, is one that turns on stress. But the key is to recognize that when we face somebody other, when we may hear or have a negative experience or have a thought, 
with our breath, we can pause and allow our thoughts to flow through our mid cortex, which is where our memories and, and um, emotions are to our frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is, as it sounds in the front of our brain, that's where metacognition is at thinking about thinking. We can reflect, we can ask a question, we can from the top down sort out the experience that we're feeling with our thoughts and relax and do what we need to, to monitor our stress. If you think about conflicts that we have now in terms of, you know, whether it's racial bias or these fears that we have of people who may be different than us, it starts in our lizard brain with a breath and a thought and a question, a connection, our wizard brain, our frontal cortex can alleviate our stress. And so the key aspect about stress is if you are living an optimal life, stress is normal. There are going to be things that are stressful. You got on this call right now, and hopefully your body went down into recovery. So there's a positive stress. You have a project due. You do it, your body comes back down into recovery. There's, to there's tolerable stress, which is, you know, maybe there's an issue with communication or there's something that causes a stress response, and you can utilize a relationship, utilize a resource to get yourself down into balance. But toxic stress, that 24 seven, when not, you know, we can't find any relief from anything is what kills us. Because when you are in that lizard brain, fight, flight, or freeze mode, and your, your brain is sending messages to every organ in your body to turn on or turn off, that means you're releasing uh, glucose into your bloodstream. You're releasing fats and lipids into your bloodstream, um, which means it, because you need energy if you're going to in the heat of battle. So if you have cholesterol, you can increase that. If you have diabetes, you risk that cardiovascular disease, your body releases fibrinogen, which makes your blood clot. So that increases the risk of high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. Your immune system can shut down or go into hyperdrive, which can impact you if you have something like multiple sclerosis or lupus. And also we know that your, your immune system can impact you, if you and turn on cells that can be precancerous. You turn down estrogen and testosterone because the last thing that you're thinking about in the heat of battle certainly is reproducing. And also you can increase anxiety and depression. So chronic stress can worsen every medical condition that you have and create new ones. And so that toxic stress is what we really have to fight against. So many of us are so stressed all the time that we don't realize what it's like to feel relaxed. And so if you take away nothing from today, understand that stress is normal, but not meant to be 24 seven. Stress can get you up to complete a project, but we have to find times for recovery. And those times of recovery happen when we get a good night's sleep. Those times of recovery happen when we eat mindfully. When we are stressed, our body naturally craves things that are sweet and salty. So if you know you're going through a stressful time, you have to actively select foods that are healthy for you, foods that are high in antioxidants. Um, how we cope when we're stressed is important. Positive coping is exercising, talking to people, um, finding sources of support, eating well, getting enough sleep. Negative coping is coming home, and drinking more or using drugs or, you know, staying up all night gambling or, you know, sexual activities that don't serve you. All of those factors can impact us. We know with COVID, drinking went up 15 to 25%. And now that we're out of COVID, some people have continued those patterns. If you recognize anything, any pattern or a habit that you want to change, and especially in response to stress, now is the time to identify it and come up with a plan to break it. Because the impact of long-term stress is physically, it can make us more anxious and depressed. And the thing with depression, when people are depressed, you don't go to your doctor's visits. You don't take care of yourself. So it, it becomes this cycle that it's hard to break. It causes digestive problems. We have more neurons in our gut than we do in our brain. Headaches can be a symptom of stress. Heart disease, as I mentioned, because you're in that chronic fight state, which we're not meant to be, sleep problems, and then weight gain. And we also have trouble with our memory and concentration. And as I mentioned earlier, our brain is our biggest ally during this time. So we have to find ways to stop the stress cycle. 
Now, many of you may have symptoms of stress, which can be headaches or you know, feeling a certain way, but anxiety can be another symptom of stress. Anxiety can be like your heart can beat fast. You may feel like you're having a heart attack, um, worrying a, a, a lot, thoughts like in the middle of something, you could have this thought like, oh no, something's gonna happen, feeling tired, feeling fatigued, emotional distress, which would be, you could be irritable, you could feel sad, and then this tension, and a lot of people, when we're stressed or have anxiety, you, know, you can find tension in your, in your shoulders or tension in your body. And the key is really to identify what the symptoms of your anxiety are. And if you can't make them go away on your own or they last longer than two weeks, to understand there are medical conditions that can cause anxiety, like thyroid disease or medications that can cause anxiety. If, if somebody's been drinking too much and then stop drinking, you can have some withdrawal symptoms or using some sort of drugs. But anxiety really is a sign to you that you need to take care of some aspect of your life. So you should get a physical, talk to your healthcare provider. And so that you there are ways to treat anxiety, but really see anxiety as a symptom. Now, burnout is what many people are reporting now. And burnout is a work-related stress. However, we know people can be burnout who are caregivers, burnout, you know, as a parent. But the factor is when you feel like you have nothing left, no gas in your tank, you're completely depleted, not motivated, and there's a state of physical exhaustion, it's a huge red flag that you need to talk to someone. Again, that person would be a healthcare provider. If you have EAP at your company, employee assistance provider, don't hold on to that. It is not a normal state. Possible causes can be feeling like nothing is under your control. You're unclear about your job expectations, working in a workplace where you just feel like nothing gets done or people are against you or you know, no matter what you're doing, you're not seen, um, you feel like you're not making contributions, where there's an extreme of active activity where it's either the complete worst or you feel like you just have nothing left, a lack of social support, and also this work-like imbalance. So if you feel burnout, it, it should be a real sign that you need to talk to someone. Feeling burnout is not a normal state at all, but one, unfortunately, that more and more um, people are reporting. But talk to a healthcare provider, talk to someone and assess it. Because the key is we have resilience and resilience is our ability to bounce back. I live in Florida where I see palm trees, especially during the recent hurricane. Ian, we, I literally saw palm trees that bent to the ground and came back up. Our bodies and brains were made for that. We are meant to be resilient. And I'm not saying that we can take on suffering, but we can come back from things. But it really is about a understanding that when you are in adverse situations, so that you're not feeling like you're bent all the time, but figuring out what it is that you need to do to get back up so that you can participate fully in your life. And, and having resilience really is about our mindset. As I mentioned, it's really important that you recognize what you're feeling and thinking at all times, right? That self-awareness, that's being mindful with the understanding that you are in control of your mindset. So no matter what's going on, you recognize it and you can flip the switch. So having a resilience mindset is much like a growth mindset where you recognize there's always a chance to improve, where you can learn from other people. You understand that we are capable of being down and getting back up, that we're, you're willing to take risks to, if something didn't work one way, that you're willing to try something new the other way. That takes energy, that takes optimism, that takes hope. You're aware of how you're thinking and feeling. You can walk into a situation and get feedback and see it as constructive and not a challenge to your being, not a threat that you can learn from it. So you look for the truth and feedback and you actively engage in self-monitoring, which you should do anyway, because there's no one who can tell you more about yourself than you. There's no one who can lay out a plan for what you need to do than you, which means monitoring when things are going well, when they're not, what you want, what you don't want, and then you continue to push through um, for your potential. Again, no matter what other people have said about you, what society says about you, what culture says about you, you focus through to push for your potential. P 
people who have high resilience recover better from cardiovascular disease. They don't perceive stress as something that's done to them. They see it as something that they can overcome. There's greater recovery from illness or trauma and better management of dementia and chronic pain. This is a typo, sorry about that, it should be chronic pain. Um, better management of, of chronic pain. And that is largely because when you're in stressful situations, remember blood pressure goes up. Uh, blood glucose goes up. So diabetes, diabetes and high blood pressure, high cholesterol are some of the biggest risk factors for dementia because it impacts your brain. So high resilience, your body is better. Having a purpose in life can help you through stressful situations. And a purpose in life has a bigger impact on cardiovascular disease, how long you live than happiness. A bigger risk, a bigger it lowers the risk. It's a bigger factor than how happy you are. And yes, being happy and having joy is essential. But when you look at how it affects us at the cellular level, a purpose in life is important. Your purpose can be your talents and your gifts and your values. You know, having a personal value system that may be different from other people's or are different from people around you. It's having the motivation you know, the optimism to continue to put energy into what you think is important so that you can achieve your future goals and overcome challenges. So purpose in life can help with stress. We can optimize stress. And one of the ways that you do that is shift how you look at challenges, shift how you look at stress. And again, I'm not endorsing suffering, but saying if you're going to achieve what you want, you're going to have a natural stress that happens to it. And the key is to is to have recovery and to get back into balance. So instead of saying that, you know, this always happens to me, or, you know, this is so bad for me, or I can't do this, you say, this is for me. And how is it for you? It's when you learn from it. And so it can help you achieve your goals. And so you have to regulate through stress by separating what causes you stress from your reaction to it. And that's the ability that we have. And how do, you, how do you change your stress response is when you recognize that maybe your heart's beating fast or your thoughts are negative or you're not sleeping is you find ways to mitigate that, to lower that. And so what you can do is practice, right? We don't have to necessarily respond to all these stressful situations that happen outside of us, but you can choose a stressful situation. For example, if you need to have a difficult conversation with your partner or a colleague, choose that situation. If you want to lose weight, so you want to run a 5K or make some kind of change, that can be stressful, right? Our brain is constantly seeing if we're safe or not. And things that may that we perceive that can cause us stress will cause us stress. You choose a situation knowing that it's going to push you some, knowing it's going to challenge you, right? So that's number one. And then you pay attention to the purpose, pay attention to what you're going to get out of it. Like it should have a higher purpose. If you want to lose weight, it's so you can be healthier. So that maybe you have more energy with your kids or have more energy in life, or you want to age a certain way. If you want to have this kind of difficult, difficult conversation. It's because you want to be understood in your workplace or have a better, different relationship with your partner or your kids or your parents. So look at the big picture. Um, there's something called post-traumatic growth, which shows when we emerge through difficult situations, we can change our narrative, we recognize our strengths, it deepens our beliefs, we learn how to get through situations. So there are things that happen when we can really optimize and push through stressful situations. We lean in for what's gonna, what's to come, what we learn about ourselves with excitement, excitement and we use our emotions to, to create meaning. So that's how we optimize stress. Again, not avoiding it, but recognizing that no meaningful life is stress-free and there are ways that we have to deal with situations that are stressful. And that is kind of where mindful self-care comes in. Again, that mindfulness is paying attention to how we feel. That mindfulness is recognizing that it's not that you have to be happy or joyful all the time, but whatever you're feeling, if it's not in alignment with what you want, that you have the potential to change it. So um, Abraham Hicks, which came out of The Secret, says, you allow yourself to keep up with what life is causing you to become. As you grow and stretch, sometimes 
people may be like, what are you doing? Like you never used to do that before. Or you may feel uncomfortable yourself because you were assuming a new position and a new outlook. And that can be stressful, but you, you are patient with the process and you endorse the process because you know that the more you learn, the more you challenge yourself and the more potential you have to transform. And that goes to building your own human capital that can only make you better. And so then you have to ask yourself, what do you want with the reality that that can be stressful? So when you are facing a stressful situation, understand, identify what the stressors are, which means paying attention, understand how stress feels in your body. How, like, where do you feel it? Your hands, your head, your stomach. And then be determined to recovery because again, our bodies were meant to make it through stress. We have resilience. We are built to adapt, but we also need recovery. That recovery happens when you eat right, eat mindfully. That recovers happens when you sleep well. It happens when you have positive thoughts. Positive thinking can change your brain. It causes neuroplasticity or different aspects of your brain light up and connect and they can become cemented in memory. It happens when you surround yourself with positive people and it happens when you get good sleep. So that's the recovery. That's where the balance comes in, even to a demanding work and, and life situation. It happens when you reflect and point to other situations that you have overcome. You know, how did you do that? And all of that can only occur when you take time to pay attention to yourself, to self-reflect. You focus on evidence-based information. Our brain does not like uncertainty. When our brain is in situations that are uncertain, when our thoughts are uncertain, our brain in a wrong way to make us feel better will take us on this roller coaster ride of all the worst things that can happen, all the what ifs. The only way to stop that is to focus on facts. If you're worried about your weight, step on a scale and come up with a plan. If you're worried about how you're doing at work, get feedback. If you're worried about your finances, look at what you have, open your bills, face things. Even though you may have some discomfort, our brain relaxes more. So facts matter. Focus on evidence-based information. Practice self-care. And self-care is not just going to the spa. It's not going to the gym. It's keeping up with your doctor's appointments, pap smear, mammograms, PSA. It's being preventive. It's, it's doing those things that allow you to take care of yourself. One of my favorite sayings for self-care is no is a complete sentence. So say no and not, not no, I'll get back to you. No, call me tomorrow, but no, so that you can set those boundaries for yourself. You, you lean in, you know, ask for help. Sometimes women, we have a hard time asking for help because we feel like we're the only ones that can do things. And that creates more stress. Women are self-sacrificers. When we are stressed situations, we'll, we'll, um, we tend to befriend. We bring more people around us and take on more instead of paying attention to ourselves. You know, there's this myth of multitasking that because of screens and smartphones, there's this myth that we can take everything in and do things. Our brain functions the best when we do one task at a time. So you do one thing and go the next, do one thing and go to the next, because there's, when we leave things undone, then our brain can feel more anxious and depressed. So I'm suggesting to you, when you're thinking about self-care, you're thinking about unlocking self-management, make the one thing that you focus on yourself, make yourself that pr priority, put yourself at the top of the to-do list. Most people are so stressed and we know there was a study the Kaiser Family Foundation did where 90% of Americans feel like we're in a mental health crisis, which means that 90% of Americans are dealing with their own things. And while they may care about you, there's a lot of things they can't do for you because we have to do them for ourselves. So pay attention to what it is that you need and then be determined to do it, which means you have to establish what is under your control and what's not. If you have adults in their household who are leaning in on you to do things that they can do, let the adults do it. If someone says they want to help you, let them help you. They may not do it the way that you do it, but at least it's getting done. Learn to delegate and also just separate what it is under your control and then use your emotions. You know, allow yourself, pay attention 
to how you are feeling inside and allow that to innervate your, your, what you're thinking. And then that can impact um, what you do, what your actions are. And it's, you know, so often our emotions and our thoughts run in together that we miss what our body is telling us. So here's an example. If the hundred of us on this call right now were on an airplane and the airplane dropped 500 feet, you're going to get a feeling in the pit of your stomach and your thoughts going to be, oh no, we're going to die, right? If you're a skydiver and you drop off the same plane, you get the same feeling in the pit of your stomach, but your thought is like, this is what I paid for, right? And it's example, the same feeling for fear is excitement. And when you're making changes and when you're practicing self-care and you're saying no or saying, you know, setting boundaries, people may push back. And that same feeling of nervous, nervousness of, you know, anxiety saying, telling somebody, you know, you're not going to make dinner because you're going to go work out or even just spend an hour for yourself can be excitement. So learn to tap into what the feelings are in your body and then ask yourself, like, body, what are you telling me? So that you can use your emotions, use your feelings to inform what you need to do. And, and that can help as you come up with, a self-care plan. And this is a quote by Maya Angelou that says, but to grow up costs the earth, the earth, it means to take responsibility responsibility for the time you take up. There's never been as important a time to know yourself, not necessarily what you do, which is important as well, but to know yourself, what's important to you? What do you value? How healthy do you want to be? How do you want to communicate with other people and how responsible do you want to be? So that radical self-optimization is, you know, how engaged are you in goal-directed activities that will serve you, serve you as you're pointing towards self-care? And that means you challenge your own barriers, which is challenge your thoughts, those things you know about you that stop you from getting what you want. If you're somebody, let's say you say, you know, I'm going to stop eating fast food, and you know that when you pass a fast food place, it's really hard because, you know, our brain likes what it likes and we'll be dialed in to do it. Don't, you know, if you usually pay cash, like hide your credit card so you can't use it. Do things that stop you to save you from yourself, so to speak, so that you can challenge those barriers and achieve your goals. Understanding that most goals are achieved in small steps, but the biggest barrier is not... Um, the process of establishing the small goals, the small steps, but it's ourselves. So, so when you're making a step for a goal, also make a step for yourself that you know will help you not get in the way of it. And then to think about pursuing worthy goals, those big goals that not only help you, but help society and help your community. And all of those factors can help you. So a setting a worthy goal is, A, understand what's getting in the way, but, but helping you work on the hard things. So you find your focus, you claim your goal, you commit to it, take small steps, remember your best self. And then also don't go it alone. There are things that you don't have to do by yourself. And, and so often we feel like it can only be us. So change that aspect of it. For some reason, my computer is not letting me advance. So those are all steps that we can take towards getting what we want and the importance of really paying attention to self-care. Oops, sorry. Um, the next is we want to do is, is to, as I mentioned, just go back for a second. Ooh, that's a lot. Um, this is the mental contrasting, which is basically where you challenge your own barrier. So if there's an obstacle, then you really identify what your own internal barriers are to achieving that. And so that inner obstacle is what you want to focus on because we want to work towards our true self, right? So that means we pause and pay attention. We experience our sensations, which again, lights up our brain. And we want to understand what we want our life to feel like which is good when you're managing stress and trying to unlike stress is recognizing those times you don't feel stressed, noticing how that feels in your body, noticing what you're doing and get more into that. And part of that is having a sense of gratitude and joy. You know, there's a quick five minute practice that you can do when you are feeling stressed or even when you're not. And number one is to ask yourself, am I breathing? Which 
invariably you are, but how am I breathing? Is my, are my breaths coming shallow or are they, are they fast? And then take a deep breath, practice that four by four that I mentioned. Ask yourself, am I moving? So get up, stand up, dance, do whatever, sit, move from one chair to the other, which lights our brain up and helps. And the third thing is ask yourself, what am I grateful for? And those times that you feel stress, it's a great just little exercise you can do to get you out of your head and connect you back to your body. Never be afraid to use, um, to laugh at yourself, to use humor as a stress relief, and then also to really dig into what it is that bothers you the most. So you can also vibe into stress, which I mentioned earlier, when you choose a stressful situation, don't avoid it. Identify your sources of anxiety and burnout, which are key, because that can help you with the plan. And again, it's one goal at a time. So you can make a whole list of things that cause you stress, pick the top three, and then go to the one and come up with a plan for that. Build worthy goals, as I mentioned, and then embrace change. And so lastly, um, it really is about action. You know, our thoughts, our words become our thoughts and, and our thoughts become our actions. And so when you're thinking about what you want to do for your self-care act, and hopefully um, you have a copy of the self-care assessment, which is a great tool to look at just to, as a monitor, just to, to trigger whatever it is you want to work on. And think about, you know, being on this call today, think about what you need to do for your self-care act. Write it down, put two steps that you can do with a mindset of what, how you will be your barrier potentially to it. And then lastly, how you're going to be accountable, how you're going to measure it, how you're going to know. And just start with one step at a time, because it truly is up to you to make the difference that you want. This is a line of just some resources. If you find that, you know, it's beyond stress or anxiety, and I'm happy to share this um, presentation, but there's a crisis line that can help, uh, even if you don't have insurance or underinsured, that can help with resources for talking. There's a distress hot, hot, hotline, suicide prevention, domestic violence, EAP, employee assistant, and also your healthcare provider for yourself. And with that, I'm going to end and stop sharing and see if there's any questions or, um, yes, you, you will get a copy. Of, they'll get a copy, right, Nick, of the webinar? Whoops, I think you're muted. I am, sorry. Yes, we will share it as soon as, uh, as, soon as we get a copy, we'll distribute it. And uh, please type, uh, I've added the self-care assessment in the chat uh, for those that are participating in the webinar. You can download it directly from the chat. And uh, if there are any questions, please type them in and I'll share them with Dr. Janet. My pleasure. Oh, Autumn says she can't see the chat. Um... Michael reminds me that uh, recording of the webinar will be posted on our, our in our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash SC Realtors. And uh, for those of you that are watching the streaming presentation, I want to thank you for joining in this afternoon and uh, appreciate your time and attention. And I'm getting some questions about the assessment. I'll email that as well. It's in the chat box. If you're not familiar with that, you just you have to scroll up a little bit and click on it and download it. But otherwise, we will get that to you uh, by email. So, Dr. Janet, thank you for your time. Um, I know I've taken some notes here that will um, address some of the things that I deal with in my life. I know that writing things down for me is a big way of getting it out of here. Yep. And and keeping it from rolling around all the time. Uh, uh, and and I made a double note of that to remind myself to continue that practice and yeah. uh, look forward to having you again with us here soon. And yeah. to all the realtors out there, stay safe, stay strong. And, you know, when we when when we've been talking about you know, the last uh, few years, when when I, I I'll end a lot of our our webinars with that tagline, Dr. Janet and and I've never thought of staying strong from a mental standpoint. We've always kind of been worried about the pandemic, right? Staying healthy, mm -hmm. but healthy uh, encompasses many aspects of our bodies and minds and in our workplace and our lives, our families, our 
our faith and, and all of our strengths and weaknesses are what make each of us unique and uh, appreciate uh, all of you. Thank you for tuning in today. And uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. Dr. Janet, thank you. Thank you. And I've given you back five minutes or seven minutes. So hopefully you will utilize that to relax, to breathe and plan your self-care. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And everyone have a great week. Thank you. Okay.